sometimes a pediatrician gives a call. The mother gave a bath to, say, a two-year-old child and feels something in the belly. She immediately brings it to the pediatrician. He feels some kind of a mass in the belly. And he calls a pediatric surgeon like yourself to be involved. What will you be thinking about before you even see the patient? Well, the first thing is that uh, you want to make sure that the parent comes in and you sit them down and you want to take all the shock and the awe out of it. And the reason I say that is because there could be anything from an, a big stomach to a big poop in the colon to a mass that revolves either an ovary or it involves a liver, a substance, or it could be a mass that involves a kidney tumor or a neuroblastoma. So the first thing you have to do is you have to calm everyone down and tell them that whatever it is, there's a way to figure it out and that there's some benign things and some things you have to be concerned about. So the first thing you do is you ask for symptoms. So for instance, is the child vomiting? Is the child constipated? Is the blood in the urine? Is there a, a color difference? And some of these tumors have certain types of symptomatology to them. So the first thing you do, what I would do, is I get an ultrasound. Because the ultrasound is an easy way to make a quick diagnosis of what it could be. Um, the ultrasound does not have any radiation to it. It doesn't have, it's painless. And it's a great first way to, to do things. So let's say you have an ultrasound. The ultrasound could show that it may be part of a liver. It may be part of a kidney. It may be a mass in the abdomen. It has nothing to do with either. Or it could be an ovary or big mass. The other questions you ask is on the ultrasound, is it solid or is it cystic? Cystic means full of fluid. And then based on those things, you then start branching out as to what it could be. Usually what we'll do is we'll augment the findings of the ultrasound with lab tests. So for instance, certain tumors of the ovary or of the liver will have certain markers to them. Those markers are AFP, alpha beta protein, and beta HCG. Those markers would be elevated. There are other markers, for instance... If they're in, elevated and they indicate what? If they're elevated, they would indicate that there most likely is a solid mass concerning for cancer or a tumor in one of those one of those um, organs. If you don't have it, does it exclude it? It makes it less likely. If you don't have it, then it would change the way you look at your diagnosis. You may still have it because some of these lesions do not produce those markers. But on the other hand, it helps you make a diagnosis. So for instance, you could send off the urine for certain markers. You're called urine catecholamines. And they are indicative of maybe a neuroblastoma. But not having those markers make it less likely for a neuroblastoma, but for something else. So if you see catecholamines in the urine, the adrenal gland produces these kind of things, so that's why you talk about a Wilms tumor. So actually, the, it's not a Wilms tumor so much as it's neuroblastoma. Oh and so what we think about that's in right. those terms is neuroblastoma is from the nerve or from the sympathetic chain. Right. So it could be at the adrenal, which is where you have nerve-type tissue that can produce those catecholamines. It can be a tumor on the spine, it can be a tumor in the, in the chest, it can be a tumor in the neck. There are a lot of places that neuroblastoma is, but what it does is it helps you define what you're up against. So the label of the problem is the key point here. Exactly, because you can go crazy trying to figure out what this is, but if you take a very logical step, I usually do ultrasound, I do lab work, I listen to the history, I do a physical, and then I'll probably end up with a CT scan. By the time those tests are done, those tests will help point to A, where the problem is, and B, give you an insight of how you can fix it.